Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Team House. This is episode 111. I'm Jack Murphy. This is Dave Park. We have an extra spicy episode for you today. Uh, we are interviewing David Phillips. He's a New York Times journalist. He's the author of Alpha. The, the subtitle on here is Eddie Gallagher and the War for the Soul of the Navy Seals. Uh, I think the, the trial of Eddie Gallagher needs little introduction to this audience. I think all of you have heard about it and are familiar with it. Dave wrote this whole 400-page book on the subject, on the deployment. I mean, a lot of stunning details that he turned up for this book that have not been reported before. And uh, I, I would go a little bit further than even just to say uh, that this was about the soul of the Navy SEALs. I mean, yes, the entire command team of SEAL Team 7 got relieved. The Secretary of the Navy ended up getting fired. There was presidential intervention in the trial and in, in the incarceration of Chief Gallagher. Uh, but I go even further to say that this became a, uh, a conversation and an argument about how we see the military and how soldiers see themselves. Uh, it became a subject of uh, two different schools of thought. Are our soldiers a profession at arms or are they these rabid dogs that need to be let off the chain to go and fight unrestricted warfare, unconfined by the rules of law? Uh, and that conversation is still with us today. We're still having it. You see it in the in the press every day. Just about is our is our military too woke? Are they too focused on diversity when they should be training to kill the enemy in combat? I mean, we're still having this argument. Um, and Eddie Gallagher is a microcosm of that. So, David, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, glad to be on. Thanks. Absolutely, man. So. We uh, typically start off the show asking about the origin stories of our guests. I'd, I'd like to ask you about how you found your way into journalism, what this pathway was for you into journalism. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the show, going about uh, going to J school uh, when 9-11 happened. And then how, you, how, this, how the Eddie Gallagher saga came up on your radar and you began covering this story. So journalists are, are by default probably pretty boring people. We don't do a lot. We just watch other people do things. So my origin story, just warning you, I'll keep it short, but it's not that interesting. Um, so I was one of those nerdy guys who who always wanted to write stuff, uh, you know. And and most journalists, they they become journalists because they they are always on the edge of things in one way or another. Either they're not quite part of the culture that they're raised in, or something like that. So I was raised by New Yorkers in Colorado Springs, and uh, for anybody <laughs> who's never been to Colorado Springs, I, I like to call it a piece of the Bible Belt, except it's up and above the the regular belt. So I call it the Bible Brooch. <laughs> uh, it's it's a it's a conservative town. Tons of military. The Air Force Academy is here. Schriever Air Force Base is here, and of course, uh, Fort Carson is here. Um, so it was like uh, in my house, we spoke a different language than I heard out in town. Um, but one of the cool parts about that is going to to school in the in the eighties and nineties in Colorado Springs, like. I would say at least half of my friends and classmates, like their parents were in uniform. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that's how I got to know the military, not as this strange thing or, or, you know, people in a war zone, but as like moms and dads. Right. Um, and I, I think that probably uh, comes through to how I, I try and cover it today. But anyway, like in the eighties and nineties, like with the exception of uh, uh, the Gulf war, which when I was, 12, I think I thought was cool as hell and lasted for a month. And I watched it on TV and I just thought it was awesome. Uh, you know, that it was like being in the military didn't mean being at war. It didn't mean being deployed really. Like a lot of the families I knew, they'd spent like two, three years in West Germany and, you know, uh, the whole family got to come and then they came home. Right. Um, so uh, I went to journalism school in uh, New York City at Columbia in uh, 2001 and started a class about a week and a half before the planes hit the towers. Um, and I didn't understand at that point, it was only like years later that I realized that like, that's basically dictated my reporting ever since. Like every story that I've written since that period is basically in some way or another, uh, 
you know, been obliquely related to that event. So uh, after journalism school, I got the heck out of New York because I'm a, like a Colorado guy. I uh, like to ski. I like to pick flowers. <laughs> I didn't like living in Manhattan. And I ended up working at the newspaper in, in Colorado Springs, uh, right at about the time that we were heading to Afghanistan and Iraq. And so uh, my friends and neighbors were deploying over and over again. And I really started to see uh, uh, the home side of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and interestingly, like just how, how uh, journalism's uh, uh, set up, we're really bad at, at covering wars in that way. Like we send people over to like write about the shooting and cover that. Uh, we have people in Washington to talk to um, uh, the generals, you know, uh, but it's sort of like it becomes almost sports reporting, right? Where you're watching the action and you're talking to the coaches about who's winning and who's losing. Uh, but no one ever goes back and does like the the like cribs edition, <laughs> you know, and like covers how people really live. And I was seeing it in all sorts of different ways. And so my intention was never to write a- about the military at all. Um, but I just was something that was the biggest story for, you know, year after year in Colorado Springs. Um, and so because I was doing it in this weird way, never going to the front door, but talking to real people, you know, uh, where they lived, uh, I, I think that that was something that other people weren't doing and, and was really helpful. And so, um, 2014, I just got a call from the New York times and they said, Hey, what you're doing for the Colorado Springs paper, you want to do that for us instead. And like, as a journalist, that's like getting called up to the Yankees. Like you never think that that's actually happened. At least I didn't. Cause I like consider myself a pretty like mediocre journalist. Um, and like, it took me about a second to say yes. So I lived in New York for a while, um, you know, went to the mothership and got the, the New York times brain chip implanted. And uh, <laughs> after a while I, I, um, uh, convinced them that it didn't really make sense to write about the military from Manhattan where like you're about as far from any military base as you could be. Mind if I go and, you know, go to a military town and they said, yeah, sure. You know, cause we've been writing remotely since 1850, not a big deal for us to work at home. Right. Um, uh, and so I, I moved back here and, and I've been doing the same job ever since I basically cover the non Washington, non uh, shooting part of the military, maybe military. The way I try to explain it to civilians is, is I basically am a foreign correspondent in the United States, and I write about a culture that most New York Times readers know <laughs> nothing about. People that you know wear different clothes, speak a different language. You know, it's very like much like going to a different country, and I try and translate what's important to those people. Uh, you know, to to a very sort of like general audience, you know, with mixed levels of success. Well, you know, you bring up something really interesting because I, you know, I had never thought about it before. But you grew up like these were real people to you. You had access to them. They're you know your friends' moms and dads and things like that, as opposed to, and, and you know you're living amongst them, um, as opposed to a writer from anywhere writing on any topic that they're not deeply immersed in, but looking from the bird's eye, you know, giving a bird's eye view. I, I'm yeah. sure that, uh, I, I'm sure that you have a lot of inside knowledge that when you read things that other people don't, when they're kind of sitting someplace else, you're like, oh, like they don't get it. I, I feel like the, the zeitgeist of, of that, what you're, what you guys are talking about is, uh, you remember the movie, the general's daughter from the 1990s. Yeah. And, and that the whole film, it's a 1990s film, and it's a very much about how the military is this very closed-off subculture where there's all this weird stuff going on. And because it's a film, it's totally over the top right. and ridiculous. But there's a hint of truth to that. But there's, like, grog bowls and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> more than anything, what I run into is people who, like, if they don't know much about the military, they, they uh, expect everybody in uniform to... Uh, be the same and think the same. And mm-hmm. so like, even in the New York Times, like uh, hierarchy, people will say like, well, what does the military think about this? Like, well, there's 2.4 million active duty people in the military. You know, that's basically the size of Phoenix. And just like Phoenix, it's full of some people who are really smart, some people who are really dumb, some people who are complete assholes, and some people who are the greatest people you'll ever meet. I don't know what they think, but right. <laughs> probably a lot. Of yeah. Where do we things. begin? Right. I, I also, uh, I think, you know, I, you're being modest also because in 2014 you won the Pulitzer prize, right. For 
the yeah, articles the coverage you... on Fort Carson. Right. And I'm not being modest. It's just one of those things. Like it's sort of like ski racing where you can watch like the Olympics and ski racing and like someone wins gold and it's because they're like a hundred of a second like faster than someone else. If the wind is different, it wouldn't be. So like, I mean, am I proud of the work I did? Yeah. But like, could it have easily been 10 other people who did awesome work that year? Like, absolutely. Okay. What led to, to that story? Yeah. So the basic story was that, uh, the army, this is, this is right sort of at the surge in um, Afghanistan. The army was taking people who were clearly injured and um, they didn't have any good fast way to, to get them out through the medical board process because that process had, was totally clogged with other dudes who were already in line. And so there were people that that found side doors through um, various kinds of misconduct charges. You know, you could chapter someone out or even charge them with a crime and threaten to court-martial them and have, essentially have them sign some papers to voluntarily quit. And that way you could get people who are really banged up, uh, been blown up in Afghanistan or had like debilitating PTSD, you could get them out quick. But the thing was, is that by doing that, by giving them these fast other than honorable discharges, you were essentially severing them from VA benefits forever. Right. And, and I think all the, I think this was happening a lot of times at, at a, a battalion commander or a company commander level where like, you know, they just got to make like quick decisions because yeah, you've got 10 guys who may need to go to a med board, but that's going to take 18 months to, to work through. And you got to go back to Afghanistan in six months. And you can't get replacements until you take care of those guys. So they needed like some release valve. And I don't think those guys like realized that they were just putting these guys into a world of hurt. Right. But those guys were showing up in Colorado Springs. We were finding them uh, like literally on the streets, uh, in the county jail, uh, in the emergency room, in all these places. And, and you know, me as, as a local was like, hey, you know, you have a problem. And you're taking it out on these guys and then you're pushing it out into the civilian society. society. And this is really bad. I mean, one of the guys that I wrote about uh, uh, worked on a B team of the special forces team. Uh, he was uh, really badly injured in a uh, EFP blast in Iraq that killed a Sergeant major. Um, he was started having all sorts of problems that probably were TBI and the, the army over-medicated him for it. And he went back to the army hospital and said, hey, you know, I, things are getting worse. They're not getting better after I started this medication. So they literally doubled his dose thinking like, oh, we'll take care of this. And he, he had a, like a freak out where he, he beat up his wife. And then when the MPs came, he beat them up too. So they put him in the jail where he became paranoid and delusional and refused to come out of uh, solitary. So what did the civilian cops in Colorado Springs do? They made him come out by beating the fuck out of him, uh, just like badly. And then, of course, in the process, he probably like struck out at them. So they charged him with assaulting an officer. So all of a sudden, this guy who really hasn't done anything except been mistreated is looking at years and years and years in prison. Right. And I just couldn't believe it. And so we just pulled this stuff together and, and over three days told the stories of three different men who really typified the problem. Wow. And, you know, it did some good. It, it put the army on notice that like your MEB process, your, your medical uh, retirement process is causing this and, and you need to do something. So <clears throat> I think this is a good preface into the book because you're sort of showing that you, you, you're very, you're supportive of the military community. You're not like some, communist military hater who's looking to you know make them look bad and to be fair my parents did have an orange 76 vw bus that we spent a lot of time in so i think i probably like i walked the line man <laughs> but i walked the line but i do like having beer with joe's johnny cash walked the line too so it's okay <laughs> um so so i think that you know just framing the motivations about the the book in that way uh, that you have done a lot of positive work for the, you know people in the military. What led you then to to this story in particular? 
Yeah. So, so one of the things that, uh, was was like the theme of the work that won the Pulitzer, but also that I've written about like over and over again, which is this idea of sometimes when guys come back from combat, uh, they're messed up in ways that may not fit in at home. And when does that, uh, does that injury of war, you know, when is it an injury that you need to treat? And when is it misconduct that you need to punish? And that's been a really hard balance for, you know, both the military and civilian society to strike. And so when I saw the story, I think my interest in Eddie Gallagher started with a short story in Navy Times that basically said, hey, this, this chief who had you know, been in for so many years and was leading a platoon was turned in and he's now been charged with murder. Wasn't a lot of details there, but I was like, oh, you know, my first ap- assumption was that many tours, that much time in, you know, what if this guy like came unglued because of his service? Mm -hmm. What if it is, you know, an injury of war and now they're throwing the book at him. So I really started off my journey um, sympathetic to Eddie Gallagher. Uh, And I should also say that I'm married to a a public defender, a defense attorney, someone whose job it is to defend those people who can't afford to a lawyer. And so I have I've seen, you know, in in hundreds of dinner table conversations, how oftentimes the system can run over the accused. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there were all these factors that had me ready to listen to understand and, and believe Eddie Gallagher. And I sort of started out to, you know, report that out, you know, is this is this theory have anything behind it, uh, you know, so. And that's where it started. That's, <laughs> I should say, that's not where it ended. Uh, it ended with really sort of a, an understanding that Eddie was an example of, of a toxic subculture, you know, almost like a virus that had spread through the seals and, and you know, was really dangerous to the organization. I think that this subject has gotten tons and tons of media attention, but up until the publication of your book, all of that media attention has really come from Chief Gallagher, his wife, his lawyer, uh, Fox News pundits, uh, and other pundits who were kind of piggybacking on this case. We have not heard until now from the other SEALs in the platoon. Right. And, and I think that's what your book really explodes, um, that topic. Um, and I'd really like to talk about, you know, your research into this subject. And, and let's just first start off talking about this deployment, this like hell deployment that they went on, um, that you had this new platoon. The platoon was basically seen as kind of the troublemakers or the, the low performers on SEAL Team 7. Chief Gallagher shows up and he's a rock star. He's turning things around for the platoon and they're going to get a real deal combat deployment to Mosul, Iraq. Um, Can you start talking to us about this and and about how this deployment sort of spun up? Yeah. Let me start first, though, by saying that my reporting actually started by talking to his wife. And that's Mm -hmm. like a a great trick that I've learned over the years, because if someone's coming unglued, their wife's going to know. They they may hide it at work, uh, but something's going to come up at home. And so my first stop was talking to his wife. Uh, his wife, Andrea Gallagher, who figures prominently in the story because she really became the his his spokeswoman. Mm-hmm. Um, so right away, she's like, nope, that ain't the story. I kept fi- trying to find ways to not directly ask it, but to try and gauge how much combat experience has this guy had? Did he lose people who were close to him? Was he ever in blast that might not have ended up in the paperwork, but really messed him up? You know, are there signs that might suggest that that he PBI and PTSD. Problems. Yeah. And and she's like, no, 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 no. That's not what this story is at all. In fact, this guy's a professional. He he knows how to do these deployments. He thrives in combat. He came back from this last deployment better than any ever before. That's not what this story is. This story is is that there's a bunch of millennials in his in his uh platoon pussies who like couldn't handle his like tough leadership style. And so they framed him for murder. And so (laughs) this is, this will be funny for you guys, but like, it's, it's truly what went through my head and like raised the warning flag that this isn't the story I thought it was. Um, 
when you're the wife of someone who's been arrested and the guy from the New York Times calls you and is very sensitive and asks you all these things about things, that guy, that reporter does not expect you to use pussies. Right. It's just like, it's this code switch thing where like, even if you might use that word all the time, like when you're talking to the judge or you're talking to, you know, whomever, or your mom's there, whatever, you like switch to like this nicer thing. And she, she didn't do that. She had this ready made kind of wild and improbable story about how, uh, you know, her husband's being railroaded by like whiny millennials that are a bunch of pussies. I was like, wow. A, if that's true, this is a hell of a story. Right. But even if the opposite is true, this is a hell of a story. Right. And so like I, I knew, okay, whatever happened is fucked up and it's going to play out in public, which in the seals never happens, but in a court martial must happen. And so we're going to not only figure out this, this, these accusations of murder, hopefully, but we're going to learn a lot about what life is like uh, in a SEAL platoon in, in, you know, the modern era, which, you know, us as journalists, you know, a lot of your listeners probably live it and they're like joking right now. But like for me as a journalist to like give a real picture to the public is really hard to do. So I figured this is a great opportunity no matter what, like strap in um, now to get to that deployment. So these guys, this whole story centers around what happened in 2017 when ISIS was being cleared out of Mosul. And remember, like ISIS had overrun half of Iraq, most of Syria. Uh, it was also launching complex, complex attacks in all sorts of Western cities. Uh, it was totally public enemy number one at that time. Uh, and the biggest concentration of those guys was in the city of Mosul, a city that had been over a million people. I don't know what it was by the time they cleared it, but hundreds of thousands of people were still there, plus probably tens of thousands of ISIS fighters. And the plan was basically to surround this whole city, let nobody out, and just sort of move in step by step and annihilate every enemy fighter there. Which if you think about it, that's not something that's really happened uh, in a long time in, in warfare in, in the United States military, yeah. like to get to have a clear identified enemy that will engage you right. and can't retreat. And, right. and there's going to be real battle that hadn't happened since, uh, I don't know, Fallujah, I think is probably uh, John, the closest. Thing. John, John Q. Public does not understand what happened in Missoula that at all. They're yeah. Stuck. And, and, um, so funny, uh, uh, a funny thing that says something about the culture of the SEALs and maybe uh, uh, special operators in general is that everybody in the SEAL teams wanted that assignment. Right. They wanted to be in on that fight. Like in the SEALs, if you are a low performer, you get deployed to someplace that's safe and friendly with good food. You know, you might go to Thailand or Estonia or something like that. And, and you have a great time and everyone's bummed about it. And if you really do a great job, they send you to places where everyone's trying to kill you and you're eating MREs. So uh, this group, Alpha Platoon, they went from kind of a mediocre uh, platoon that didn't have cohesive leadership. And then when Eddie Gallagher showed up, like everything clicked. And they became the highest performing platoon in that team. And they got the toughest and most sought after deployment. And when these guys all went over there together, they loved Eddie. Eddie had, was a hard charger. He had, uh, and, and like a legitimately nice dude and charismatic guy. And he had a, a real skill for like clearing a lane through the bureaucracy to save the guys from doing some of the pointless bullshit during the training and workup that that they don't need to do but at the same time making sure they got hooked up for the right training that would really help them like they loved him uh and and they were excited to go to war with him and and so uh they got there and very quickly uh everything changed <laughs> everything changed in a way that i think a lot of them didn't expect um, I don't know if you, you where and, do you want to go with I, it? I mean, we could go any number of them. In, in, the, in the book, it really, I mean, there were some warning signs, some red flags during that workup that you write about. I mean, any, you start to see when you, they're going and they're doing uh, the shoot house, and he's not able to distinguish between friendly and enemy targets. He's just shooting everything inside the room. 
Um, that, that incident where he threatens to stab some other seals. Um, there's some red flags that the guys are kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? But then there's this sharp delineation, at least the way you write it in your book, that when he touches down in Iraq, like it's not the a, a slow um, sort of downward spiral to becoming Colonel Kurtz. Like he's there the second he lands in country, basically. Yeah, that's what these guys describe, and I think what was really the head trip for them is that during workup, these red flags you mentioned, it wasn't clear that they were red. Like afterwards, after they say they saw him stab a prisoner, they're like, "Yep, red flags all the way back." But at the time, uh, they weren't sure. And I'll give you some examples. Like, so they're all going through training at the kill house and they spend weeks, you know, working on these different scenarios and, and everything has to be down to the detail. And there's, there's all sorts of instructors watching from overhead and scoring you for every little mistake. And at one point during a, a complex scenario, uh, Eddie Gallagher comes in and, and it's, it's a multi-room scenario with a mix of unarmed friendlies and armed uh, combatives. And he shoots everybody in there, friendlies and uh, enemies. And the guys are watching from above like, oh, man, like that was a major screw up. Like if I did that, I'd get fried. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing happened to Eddie. Eddie just sort of laughed it off. And he was he was friends, good enough friends with the 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 seals that were overseeing the instructors that like nothing's really going to happen to him. And so what the guys couldn't figure out is, is Eddie incompetent is eddie not able to do these complex scenarios or is eddie so experienced that he can blow off training and it doesn't matter mm -hmm. like because eddie's uh about 10 years or more older than a lot of these guys mm -hmm. all of these guys have been on deployments before but certainly have nowhere near the experience eddie does and so they're not sure if like he's the one who's wrong or they are right you know and so <clears throat> In all sorts of scenarios where where he's like blowing stuff off or or cutting corners or things, they're wondering like, well, maybe this is just how it's done. <clears throat> but then when they get to uh, when they get to Iraq, what these guys describe is that Eddie Gallagher becomes really sort of morbid and focused on combat, and not just on like kicking ass. But like the the grim yeah. possibilities of combat yeah. that right. other guys are going to get killed or hurt, and he talks about it in graphic ways to to second in command and others, and uh, he seems uninterested in you know the types of steps that you would take to minimize casualties. Um, you know, talking about what tactics we're going to use to get up in the fight. And he very much frames it as like, hey, guys, good news. Like, we're not going to follow the rules that have been set by us for us. We're going to just go in and get some. And I think the guys at first were like, that's great, uh, which is a very SEAL thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's sort of baked into the SEAL culture that that rules are, are there to be broken. Um, but then they realized that he didn't have like a plan B you know, a better plan than, than what the brass had put out there. He just wanted to like go in and start shooting. Uh, and, and, you know, that I think understandably really freaked some people out. What, what was really striking, I think in the book is we set, set aside all this war crime stuff for a moment. He, he comes across completely incompetent and unable to do his job. I mean, from, from whatever standpoint you want to look at, he's not technically proficient. He doesn't understand how to use the weapon systems that are organic to a SEAL platoon. Uh, he, he's not tactically proficient. He doesn't understand how to properly use tactics in an urban environment or, or in an advisory capacity. Uh, however you want to look at or from a leadership standpoint, it's like he is fundamentally unable to do the job of being a platoon chief. I mean, he abdicates almost every responsibility he has as the chief over these young SEALs. Yeah, so... Pretty much right away, the way the SEALs described it to me, um, he, the, every SEAL in the platoon and, and all of the coalition forces are, are using a tracker basically on their phone. Right. That, yeah, the, essentially like a Blue Force tracker type right. of situation, that ATAC, so that, that the, the head shed can see where everyone is and no one gets iced by, uh, you know, a friendly missile strike. We, we talked um, about this with, uh, with Bryant, the uh, JTAC, a few weeks back, talking about strike cell operations in Iraq. Yeah. And, and immediately Eddie says, well, we, we're going to turn our trackers off because 
under the rules, we have to stay a click back from the front lines and we need to get up closer than that if we're going to get any action at mm-hmm. all. So everyone turn off your trackers. And the guys were down with that. They're like, oh yeah, right. sure, of course. Why, if, if To do our jobs, we need to like cut through some of the red tape, done. Right. But when they get there, like immediately what he does is he he's, he's the chief of the platoon, right? He's the tactician. He's the one who has to have eyes on all the moving parts. When they get to the front lines, the first thing he does is borrow someone's sniper rifle and just goes up on a roof and, and plays Chris Kyle, essentially. And he does that day after day after day. David, um, what can you repeat essentially that? Leaving the platoon to do its own thing. Can you? Yeah. Re- you, you re- uh, he essentially does that. The, Tell he, me when it's good. He, he grabbed their sniper rifle and he did what? You, we okay. lost you right there. Sure, uh, no problem. So as soon as he got to the front line, he'd grab a sniper rifle and go up on a roof and and play Chris Kyle. You know, t- taking shots all over the place. Uh, and he did that day after day. And the the most of the seals were sort of left in the trucks, you know, for the most mm-hmm. part. Uh, and the the second in command, this seal named uh, Craig Miller, was sort of left to do the chief's duties. And the guys were looking at each other like, what, what the hell's going on? And the way one of them described it to me is like, you know, Eddie's supposed to be the coach of the team. You know, he's supposed to have his eyes on all the X's and O's. But instead, the coach has like gotten off the, the bench and, and gone in to try to dunk. <laughs> right. <laughs> and everyone's sort of like, not your job, dude. Like, there's an important job that you need to be doing, and this isn't it. Um, but they also like, you know, in a, a small unit like that, that's forward deployed, like the chief is God. Like if you, you can't really like complain to the boss, if you do, you're going to be sent home, you know, best case scenario. And so they just had to figure out, okay, if Eddie's going to do this every day and, and just, you know, focus on getting as many shots from his sniper rifle as he can, we're kind of on our own. And so how do we try to operate the best we can while making the, the best of this really weird situation? Yeah. I mean, the, the way you write about it is, and the other SEALs describe it is that he was basically just going out there every day, taking a sniper rifle up to the front lines and shooting at nothing and claiming that he was racking up this huge kill count or, or even worse, he was shooting at civilians in some cases, shooting at like school children in one instance that you describe in the book. Yeah, you know, it's funny, it, it started slow, like, at first, Eddie would often be up there by himself. And, and you know, the guys could hear shots. And then he'd come back down to the, the trucks and be like, Oh, you know, I, I got four guys today or something like that. And, and that would, that was sort of typical, you know, he'd, he'd sort of offhand mention how many kills he'd gotten that day. Uh, and he started bringing other snipers and, and other folks with him. And they started sort of quietly reporting to the platoon, like, hey, uh, from what I can tell, Eddie Gallagher's shooting at nothing and then claiming he's got shots. And sometimes I'm pretty sure he's not even shooting towards the front line. Like, I think he's shooting towards like friendly areas. Uh, and it became like a running joke, like amongst the, the platoon where Eddie would come down and guys would be like, hey, Eddie, how many did you kill today? You know, and he wouldn't necessarily know they were, were joking. Right. Um, and and it was kind of weird and funny and pathetic to them yeah, until yeah. until guys started seeing him actually connect with people, people that they thought were not, you know, clean targets, you know, like or even close to clean targets. You know, unarmed uh, adults, you know, with children, uh, shooting at children, shooting at crowds of of, of families, uh, you know, trying to get water at the river, shooting at school age girls. Uh, and, you know, in a, everybody had stories of seeing this type of stuff. I mean, there were only a couple people who testified about it, but, but I think a far greater number of them actually saw it. Um, and that became a really a problem because it's not funny anymore when you're watching your chief murder someone. Right. Uh, and you know, what people told me, what guys in the platoon told me is, is Eddie would respond by saying like, oh, you guys are being naive. Like, everybody in there is ISIS. Like, you don't think women are ISIS. You don't think that old man's ISIS. Like, you don't think the family going to get water isn't going to give it to ISIS. And he had ways to sort of justify this. But, you know, I don't think that the other guys who had at least as much understanding of Mosul and the battle terrain there as as Gallagher did felt that way at all. Like, they felt that he was so over the line that he'd just gone mad. 
David, what was uh, Gallagher's history of deployments up until this point and his relationship with the SEALs that he worked with in previous deployment? That's a good question. So, that's a really good question. Yeah. And um, I don't, I can't give you as good of an answer as I want because uh, during my investigation, I I found a picture of a plaque from from one of his really kinetic deployments to Afghanistan, and it had the names of every single guy that he deployed there with. And I contacted every single one of those guys, and nobody said a word to me. So I don't know as much about how people felt about him as I wish I did. Um, but let me just run through what his military career is. Uh, he joined in 99 as a Navy corpsman uh, and wanted to become a SEAL. That's why he enlisted, but didn't actually get to the SEAL teams until I believe he actually like was assigned to a team in 2000, late 2005. Uh, in the in-between time, he was, I think, forward deployed when the uh, Iraq war broke out and he uh, went to Iraq with a Marine unit. Um, he came back, he did buds, he washed out with, I believe, an injury, um, the first try and made it on the second. Uh, uh, very quickly after that, he deployed to um, uh, Afghanistan with a, a platoon that called themselves the Good Old Boys, and then did another deployment about um, two years later with, with you know, a significant number of the same crew. Um, uh, after that, he became a BUDS instructor. Uh, he ran into some problems there that I was able to find out about physical abuse of, of some of the, the students. I should say more physical abuse than is, is just in the program, um, you know, kicking and hitting. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, telling inappropriate, like gruesome war stories that he, he uh, uh, came up later also. Um, uh, after that, he did a couple quiet uh deployments to the Middle East where, where he was in a crisis response unit, but was never like called in um, or, or just sat on a base. So he has a lot of deployments uh, and two of them, the Afghanistan ones, I, I suspect he, he saw significant action. Um, he has a, a bronze star with V from, from one of those deployments. Uh, he also was given one for, for his deployment to Mosul. Uh, his reputation um, is mixed. I think he's both like, he's one of those guys that is, is uh, just like really good at ingratiating himself to people, even while he's a, a, you know, serial fuck up, you know, he kept doing things wrong, getting in trouble. There's one example where he got in a fight with a, a gate guard at, at Coronado and uh, was arrested for assaulting him. So like stuff like that, that was just like kept getting in his way uh, but at the same time, he was really well liked and considered like a real like seal seal and a, and a, a, a true fighter. And so like guys would clean up after him, make right. things go away quietly, help him out. He didn't promote fast, but he did keep promoting. You know, by the time he was chief, uh, a lot of his friends who were the same age had already uh, uh, commanded a platoon and were a little ahead of him. And I think the seals, the young seals that deployed with him to Mosul they think that part of the reason that that he was so intent on on claiming all sorts of kills and and shooting people was that he he wanted to measure up to some of these guys ahead of him some of his peers that had achieved more he wanted to he believed in the seals he loved the seals he wanted to be up in that upper echelon and i guess he saw that as a way to get there yeah, David, I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up with you. The uh, 2010 incident in Marja um, that I, I wrote about um, back in 2019, you write about it in this book where Eddie was attached to a special forces ODA from third special forces group. And my sources informed me that he shot an unarmed farmer out in a field. Um, they were out there with Gallagher um, and this farmer kept coming out to the field in the middle of this huge, it was a huge military operation, this huge firefight. And uh, the special forces guys would try to wave this farmer off, try to get him to go back inside. And he'd just come back out and, and keep working his land, like oblivious to this firefight. And Gallagher, from what I was told, uh, was up there and shot the farmer. Completely unarmed dude. They knew he was a civilian. Um, 
I contacted at the time, I contacted Gallagher's lawyer, Tim Parlatore, to ask him about this incident because I'm trying to do the right thing as a journalist, ask for a comment from the other side. What, what do you have to say about this incident? And uh, Mr. Parlatore told me that um, no, Gallagher wasn't there. He wasn't in Marja. Never happened. Impossible. And, but then you, uh, in the course of your reporting in this book for Alpha, you uncovered a Navy award which was given to Gallagher for his actions in combat in Marja, Afghanistan in 2010. Yeah, so you and I talked about this at the time because we're both trying to report this story of like, well, was he was he in uh, Marja or not? And mm -hmm. it was a... Uh, <laughs> It was slippery, man. It was slippery because this is 10 years before. Mm -hmm. And the story, as I was told, is, is that the team is uh, getting ready to go in on this big op. And right before they leave the FOB, this Navy sniper, blonde hair, kind of a shit talker, shows up and is like, hey, you guys need a sniper with you? Like, I'll come on. Like, the SF guy saw him as like a stolen valor kind of guy. Like, he was telling all these, like, war stories about how many kills he has. Like, no one wanted to be around him. Yeah. So, like... The way that it's told to me, and I'm sure to you too, because I think we talked to some of the same guys, um, they get to this this uh, essentially house on an intersection where they're going to set up a strong point. And Eddie's up on the roof, or sorry, I need to be very careful here. This seal, this blonde seal with a red beard who's on the roof is shit talking, saying that he doesn't really like how the, the uh, special forces operates. Uh, he makes a number of tactical mistakes early on, including accidentally shooting at one of the uh, Afghan army yeah. trucks that comes in, the friendlies. Uh, and then during this this firefight that happens the, the next day, you know, it's it's a firefight not like in the movies. You know, it, there is shooting. It's all There is killing and there is dying, but there's also like long, long lulls. And during these lulls, this farmer keeps coming out and trying to work his land. Remember, this is the beginning of spring crucial time for these folks right uh, he needs to get stuff done and at some point the seal uh shoots this guy it's not like he was caught in the crossfire it's not like anyone could think he was a threat according to the special forces guys i talked about you know he's at a distance and the sniper just smokes him and the special forces guys are like whoa what the fuck did you just do dude and they go down off the roof and they essentially tell the boss and the boss quietly puts this seal on a helicopter that saying, you know, fuck you very much. Yeah. Uh, we'll thank see you next time. Thank, thank you for, thank your, you service. for your service. Yeah. Don't come back. So what do we do with that? Right. We've got a couple different seals who were there who or sorry, a couple different soldiers who were there who all agree. Seal sniper, blonde hair, blondish red beard on the roof, shoots this guy for no reason. Now, here's the first place it connects to Gallagher. One of those soldiers is, is arrested many years later, and he's about to make a plea deal, and he's talking to the FBI. He's arrested for uh, uh, possessing child pornography. And, he, and during his plea deal, he says, oh, and by the way, you know that SEAL who's facing those charges for the stuff in Mosul? I saw him shoot someone in uh, Marja as well. Um, so they say, whoa, okay, let's do a lineup. And they put up a, put out a bunch of photos and say, does any of these guys look like the, the seal that you saw? And it's 10 years later, this soldier had seen that seal for maybe 24 hours uh, during a combat operation. So take what you will of what, how good his memory is. Plus, we don't know if the pictures that they showed of, of Gallagher in that lineup look anything like the ratty, bearded, right. sunglasses, helmet, seal that that this guy would have seen? Or is it cleaned up, shaved, short-haired Gallagher in a suit? Long story short, the, the soldier facing charges uh, uh, picks the wrong guy. Can't ID him. Uh, and basically for uh, uh, the law enforcement, the case ends there. Um, but we sort of went forward with it and said, okay, other guys had to be there, guys who aren't facing child pornography uh, <laughs> charges. Let's talk to them. And I don't know how many you were able to talk to. I was able to talk to two others uh, who confirmed it. I was able to identify 
three others who would have had direct knowledge in our active duty. And I asked the army and SOCOM to make those guys available. And guess what? They didn't make them available. So none of those guys could say to me, look, I remember that seal from 10 years ago. I remember his name and his name was Eddie Gallagher. I'm a hundred percent sure. None of them said that to me. They all said, Hey, look, we're all, they were all, totally consistent on the story of what happened. They remembered the seal, just couldn't remember who he was. So, you know, I was like, do I even include this? Is that enough? I don't want to accuse somebody of murder if they weren't even there. Right. And it was really kind of late in the research for me that I started going through Eddie's uh, evaluations, you know, the the write-ups that everybody gets, what, quarterly? I don't don't know how often you get. Yeah, like an evaluation report. Once a year? Yeah, I think they're quarterly, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and their one is signed by, um, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Bryce, who later figures in the story. Uh, and it's, it says, hey, Eddie did such a great job on this deployment. And one of the most awesome things that he did is he helped uh, kill several enemy combatants while on an operation with special forces in Marja, Afghanistan, you know, right during the time period when they were talking about. Him. So we don't know for sure that the seal that shot the farmer is Eddie Gallagher, but we know he was there. Right. We know that he matches the description, both in terms of his char- character, how he acted and how he looked. Um, we know that there are people that would be able to say for sure. For example, uh, the uh, uh, captain running the A team who would have had the manifest, but we have not been able to see that evidence yet. And for people who are watching this or who are wondering like, well, how can they not know, like, why wouldn't it be in its record? It's because when you deploy to an area like Iraq or Afghanistan, that deployment will be will be noted. But guys move around the country, like, all, all the time. Sure. And that's not really no. tracked officially. There's something else that I haven't been able to figure out. It's tantalizing. Um, for some reason, Eddie Gallagher got separated from his t- platoon. And from what I can tell, and this is partly based on his own telling of it on various podcasts, he essentially got sent to timeout. Like they were doing a village stability platform uh, operation much farther south, and he gets sent back to a big fob. Was it just a personal disagreement? Was it some tactical dis- mistake? Did he kill somebody? Unclear. But for some reason, he's sitting by himself far away from his command and anybody else. Uh, and he then essentially volunteers for this Green Beret mission. He gets sent home from that too. Now, he probably then tells a story to his lieutenant about what he did while the lieutenant was elsewhere, Mm -hmm. and the lieutenant just writes it up. I mean, Mm -hmm. certainly there were no other SEALs with Eddie that would be able to to verify that. And if there's one thing that I've learned from writing this book, it's that Eddie Gallagher is not a reliable source. (laughs) So back to Mosul, uh, it's also reported in, in your book that Eddie was abusing drugs as well, some different types of prescription drugs that, that he was trying, he was hooked on quite badly, yeah. It, sure, it seems like it. I mean, yeah. I'm not in a position to say for sure that he was, was addicted to drugs, but what we can tell, so as a journalist, I got something that, that I will probably never get again and uh, was extremely useful to me, and that is that... Uh, NCIS seized Eddie Gallagher's phone and downloaded everything that was on it. And then at some point in the process, I got all of those texts, thousands and thousands and thousands of texts. So you can see Eddie talking to people about drugs, trying to get drugs, disappointed that he doesn't have drugs, wondering where he can get drugs. Um, And I was able to, to sort of piece together sort of a rough outline of probably what happened. And it's, it's really a story that's common yeah. in all of America. Yeah. And that's that uh, he started getting a uh, opioid prescription called tramadol, really common in the military, uh, less common in the civilian world, but you can think of it a lot like Oxycontin. Um, uh, and uh, he started using it regularly. And when it ran out, he went and got more and more and more. And he would do what so many Americans did is, is go at first to uh, the doctor to get it and get pretty big refills. uh, And no one was really watching how much anyone was taking. And then when things started to tighten down uh, and you couldn't get those anymore, he had to find other sources. So at one point, and this this is one thing that really pisses off the guys in his platoon. At one point, he sort of corners the youngest 
lowest ranking guy in the platoon who is uh, uh, Mexican American, grew up just north of the border uh, in San Diego. And his mom uh, was a Mexican citizen and, and would cross in regularly over the border. He cornered him and said, hey, get your mom to go to Mexico for us and buy us a bunch of tramadol. Uh, and I, I think he did this a couple of times. Um, and of course, if you're the younger guy, like you can't say no to your chief. Right. You have to do this. And right. so he, he was sort of uh, corrupted by Eddie, which it, you know, is a twofer for Eddie, right? Because not only does he get his pills, but now this guy's compromised. Now this guy can never speak against Eddie because Eddie's got something on him. And the guys felt that in different ways, Eddie tried to do that to all sorts of people. Um, you know, why is there a photo of Eddie uh, and the person that he killed or, or, you know, was accused of killing and everybody else in the platoon? Why did Eddie make that happen? Uh, he was trying, uh, to, com- he was trying to compromise the people around him. Right, right. So that you can't necessarily speak up. You're not clean. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, but part of that is that, that he, throughout the deployment was, from, from what I can tell, the evidence suggests he was using tramadol pretty regularly. He was also using steroids, probably not that uncommon in, in uh, that world, um, but something certainly that, that he was doing. And also um, uh, he was using a, an upper called ProVigil. Um, uh, and I don't know what the combined effects of those are. But what the guys said is that Eddie was oftentimes acting really erratically, um, you know, either like kind of out of it or like unusually energetic. And and they just felt like he was increasingly paranoid. They didn't. They felt that that those substances were having an effect. David, I, I want to start getting into the the alleged war crime that he ended up going to trial for. Um, some of the most, for me, stunning reporting in this book, in Alpha, is the information you dug up about the ISIS fighter. That throughout all of the reporting about this incident, um, this was just an unidentified Iraqi teenage kid. Like many others, just another ISIS fighter who ended up in a mass grave somewhere. God knows who he is. And for most people, they probably don't really care. But there's a whole chapter inside your book about Motaz Muhammad Abdullah. I, I was just shocked by some of the information that you uncovered about who this person actually was and what his story is. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. Where do you, do, would you like to start with him uh, first? Before? Let's let's start with the, the killing. And sure. How, like, here's a guy who didn't have any identity. So the situation is, is that they're out on a uh, the SEALs are out on a mission. Uh, where they are supporting some Iraqi commandos who are moving forward to, to take this small collection of houses on the ex- out, outskirts of Mosul that where ISIS is holed up. And it's a pretty big operation. I think they even have an M1 tank involved just to sort of support. And, you know, several dozen Iraqis moving in. Um, at one point, uh, the SEAL platoon gets some signals and tell that tells them, hey, there's a bunch of fighters and possibly the boss in this house and the JTAC spins up an Apache uh, and says, can you hit this with a Hellfire missile? Missile goes in and a lot of people are killed. After the operation is over, everything's quiet. This little village is pretty much abandoned. The Iraqi soldiers find uh, one guy alive and they say, hey, we're bringing him back. Um, Eddie hears this over comms and says, "Uh, nobody touch him, he's all mine. At this point, Eddie's like maybe a kilometer away from where the the, uh, captive is actually being brought. And he drives, you know, he leaves the front, leaves the operation and drives back to this fighter. Uh, He he finds the fighter and we actually have video of this. He he says to the Iraqis, oh, is this guy ISIS? I got him. I got him. And he's got a big medical kit with him. Now, Eddie is a trained medic, but he hasn't been a, a medic in terms of his profession for years. Right. Uh, and none of the SEALs in the platoon have ever seen him, you know, so much as offer a Band-Aid to anyone. It's just not part of his gig. But they watch kind of dumbfounded as Eddie starts doing medical treatments on this guy, you know, checking his wounds um, and then eventually doing a, a crike on his neck, an emergency airway right here. Um at some point, and I wish I was clearer on this, but I, I don't have 
have perfect details. At some point, uh, the two actual medics and, and one of the younger SEALs from the platoon get involved in this. They start helping Eddie out and they're, they're essentially performing life-saving medicine. Now, Eddie has said, and I don't, I don't know if I can refute this. Eddie has said, man, we were just doing that stuff on him basically to like experiment with him. And like our intent was to kill him. I don't know if that's true. I haven't heard that from other people. However, you know, I don't expect that people would be truthful if that was. I can tell you this, everything that they did was consistent with how you would treat an American who was injured in the same way. Now, were they just doing it because they wanted to practice that stuff and they didn't really care that much if this guy lived or died? I'm not sure. But, but they weren't doing anything that they didn't need to do. Um, so they give this guy an emergency airway, they give him uh, an emergency IV through an inner osteo uh, right into his chest plate. They do some um, uh, decompression needles in the side of his chest cavity to let out air from a collapsed lung. And then like pretty much everything they can do is done. And now it's either a question of, are we going to transport this guy to a hospital or are we going to just let him sit here and die in the dirt? And they didn't know what the answer was to that. That's a decision made by someone higher up than them. So they're kind of sitting there, kneeling by the body. And according to the SEALs who were there, Eddie then takes out his knife, stags, stabs the kid in the neck a couple of times until he dies and leaves. So that's the, the murder that sort of became the center of his court martial. He was charged with first degree murder for you know executing a prisoner in cold blood. Uh, Eddie, by the way, uh, denies this, says it never happened. Um, uh, but what was interesting through the whole trial is that not only what did the, the Navy investigators never figure out who this kid was, they never found his body. Uh, they never even acknowledged that he might've had a name. They never even called him John Doe, you know, no. uh, they just called him the victim or the fighter or the patient, or, you know, in some cases, if it was the defense attorney talking, the terrorist. You know, and they never acknowledge that this is somebody that uh, is a human, has a mother, has mm -hmm. a father. Uh, uh, and I knew that that had that happened, maybe the trial would have been completely different because it's very easy to acquit someone when there's not a real victim. You know, uh, when their mom and their dad aren't sitting in the room watching you deliberate, uh, when you never learn about what they were like. And so I, I, I got to admit, this was not me. I, I told you before, I'm a mediocre uh, journalist, and, and this goes into that evidence file. Uh, one of our other journalists, a brilliant guy named Tim Arango, who was uh, stationed in Iraq as a reporter for the New York Times for years, was like, called me up. He's like, hey, did anyone ever figure out who that guy was? And I was like, no, man. He's like, do you mind if I do? <laughs> I was like, hey, go nuts, dude. I'm <laughs> like, go nuts. But you know, what I didn't realize is, We've had some staff in Iraq, Iraqi staff that we've been working with at the Times for 20 years, guys who grew up in Mosul, guys who know the culture, know the neighborhoods, know this guy's accent. And so they essentially like canvassed the neighborhoods where they thought it was likely. And it didn't take our, our Iraqi staff long wow. to come up with the guy. And then working side by side with a... Uh, uh, an Iraqi journalist, I interviewed the, the father. Um, now, let me say something before I tell you about um, Moataz, the, the guy that we identified. This is not perfect. Uh, it's only the best we could do. Uh, his body has never been found. And so you can't match the DNA to Eddie Gallagher's knife. And by the way, there's DNA of an Iraqi on that knife, uh, which I don't think many people know. Um, uh, so we can't say 100% that, that this is the right guy. Um, the way that I matched it was through uh, the stories from his family that matched the timeline. Um, the photos that his family provided that matched the basic... The video um, that our Arakia television took. Right, right. Photos of, of him both when he was dead and when he was alive, because there was an Iraqi journalist, as, as you said, who was was uh, there at the time and did a very short uh, interview with the kid as he was as lying there in the dirt. Um, so I, I looked and I was like, okay, 
you know, there's a, a pretty good resemblance here, but like, can I be sure? Can I be sure? And I kept looking at the, the dead body, the kid, because there were some close up photos of his face. And it's like, what can I find? Does this kid have some unusual like divot in his nose or a scar in his eyebrow or something like that? And I looked and I was like, it looks like his earlobe is messed up. It looks like it's like a deformity where essentially there was no lobe. It was just the cartilage. And I was like, okay. And then I pulled out the, the family photos and I looked at them and I was like, well, I see that in like two of these photos, but in others, I don't like, and these aren't perfect photos. It's not a mugshot. You know, it's like, the, you know, a family photo or something. It's not everything you want. So it's like, I see it in two photos, two of the photos from when that are most recent, but I don't see it when he's a little younger. And so I called up the Iraqi journalist I was working with. And I was like, I need to call the dad and I need you to ask um, if, if he's got any scars or anything, but don't mention the ear. We don't want to steer him towards it. We just want to ask. And he asked him and, and he, he gave a couple examples, but one of the things that he said is like uh, during the battle for Mosul, uh, he, his son had had a shrapnel injury that had hit him right there and essentially cut his earlobe off. And I was like, good enough for me. Like that's yeah, such a, yeah, wow. I'm not going to get DNA, but, but that is such an unlikely correlation that, that I'm comfortable with using uh, Moataz's story. And what was interesting is learning how typical his story was. You know, he's a kid who had grown up in Mosul his whole life. His dad was a working class dude who sold used cars. Um, and, you know, like a lot of kids as a, a teenager, he loved sports and he loved pop music. And so like his, his, his bedroom is covered with, with soccer posters and, and like posters of like Western, like bad you know, boy bands. Um, and when Mosul comes to take over, like everything is shut down, schools shut down, like work is shut down. People are barely scraping by. And one of the things that that Moataz can still do is meet up with his friends at the neighborhood soccer field um, and play. And so he goes down there like every day. And his father's really happy with this, you know, because he knows it brings his son joy, but but he very quickly realizes that it's a huge problem because ISIS knows that the big battle is coming. They mm -hmm. don't have as many fighters as they want. If they can mobilize mm -hmm. any male in the city that they can to become an ISIS fighter, that's really going to help them out. Right. And so where do you find young men down at the soccer stadium? And they start essentially grooming them and recruiting them, giving them balls, giving them shirts, playing soccer with them, you know, being cool guys right. and telling them, Hey, look, part of your duty, the Americans are going to come in here. Uh, you know, uh, they're going to wreck your city. They're going to rape your sisters. Like it's your job. And they're going to come in here with the Shias who are a bunch of dogs who've kept mm -hmm. us down for years. It's your job to as a good Sunni Muslim, as a member of this city to stand up and defend it, you know, and, and you guys enlisted in the military, I'm not going to tell you that at a certain age, that type of talk about a greater purpose is really like effective. Mm -hmm. And he was recruited, and his father figured this out and dragged him home and was like, you stay away from those sons of bitches. He, 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 like, like, chained, he like chained him to the wall at one point, didn't he? Yeah. So the second his, his son like, yeah, 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 whatever, ran away. He went and got him again and like chained him up in the kitchen. Uh, and his father like sort of laughed when he told me the story. And he's like, unfortunately, it was a really cheap Chinese chain and <laughs> he broke it with a kitchen knife and he escaped. So he had literally was so desperate to keep his son away from ISIS that he had chained him up in their house and his son had escaped. And he never saw him again. He never saw him again until uh, the city was liberated and the family survived barely. And they were watching news about Eddie Gallagher's court martial. And the Iraqi news was showing some of this archival footage of, of the, the kid that he killed on the day that, that he was killed. And, and his father stands up and essentially says, my God, you know, that's my son. That's my son. He had never known what had happened to him. He had hoped, you know, that somehow through the whole battle, he was alive, mm -hmm. but suddenly he finds out that no, he was murdered and he was murdered by one of the Americans. Um, and I asked him how he felt about that, you know, and of course, how do you feel about finding out that your son's been killed? But, but the thing that he said first was, I was surprised that it was the Americans that killed him because I thought that the Americans were more 
professional. Mm -hmm. Like he was a child and there was no reason for this. You know, he, he couldn't even move. And so it surprised me that they did that. I think he wouldn't have said that if, if like the Shia yeah, militia yeah. had done it. No, there would be no surprise there. Um, there there's much more on this deployment, um, including what happens when Dalgar's platoon turns off their trackers and their EOD guy gets shot when they're at a place they're not supposed to be. And now to maintain this fiction and this big lie they have going to hire, they have to move the guy to an area they're supposed to be before they call in the medevac. But you right, guys could right. you guys you guys could read the book if you want to learn more about that. I would, I do want to get into what happens when they get back stateside. Um first we just gotta talk about our sponsors for a moment here. Let's you, do it. You wanna grab that uh this household five oh, soap? Oh yeah, for sure. Right there. So our first sponsor is Household Five Soap, a veteran owned company. And uh I have been happily using this soap for a little while now. Uh they make all kinds of cool soap. There's this nice uh Beard oil also been enjoying this. Uh, yeah, I uh, some of that. It, I'm, I'm, I'll tell something? you what. Like, I'll send I, you some. I never think of soap. You know, I go into the supermarket and grab whatever. Like, you know, uh, it, just not, you know, like liquid soap. Like, not palm oil, but you know, like what the stuff you use on dishes. Yeah. you know, it's all the same. <laughs> and and then and then we get sent these boxes, and I don't, it's I can't like, remember the name of the soap. What, that I, I was what using. have I been missing all these? Videos? But. But I have like like tobacco and bourbon or something like that. Like it smells so good. I and uh and this their lip balm, uh this is Dolce de Leche, I think, or Leche de Dolce, whatever it is. But if you're a Marine, a former Marine, or you know a Marine, or you think <laughs> like a Marine, you are gonna replace all of your crayons for this because it's delicious. <laughs> no, it, it it is delicious. Um it's it, Guys, and it works. It's natural go, beeswax. It's go, go to household5.com and use the code team20 at checkout to get 20% off. Yeah. Check it out. Veteran owned, naturally made, homemade soap company. And I'll send you some beard some beard oil. Uh the beard the beard oil is nice. Uh, smells good. And then our second sponsor for tonight's show is Manscaped. And you guys know this company. We we hawk their products all the time. Not not only are they a sponsor of this show, but we also use it ourselves. Yeah. We can't show you on the show because uh, we get kicked off of YouTube. But Manscaped makes trimmers for trimming your nether regions without clipping yourself or hurting yourself in the process. Now they uh, and they make it. I don't know if you're into male grooming, but uh, if you were. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like when you see a scarecrow out standing in the field. Do you want a really ratty? You know. You, uh, <laughs> Unkempt. Really how much you want to scare the crows. Unkempt scare. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we don't want to scare our crows away. We so, don't want to scare our girlfriends away. Yeah. So, um, no, but if you ever tried to do it with, like, just regular hair trimmers, you've probably had the Accidents Nick or two. Happen. Um, Manscaped takes care of that. They have sort of this Nick-proof technology. Plus, they have, like, this LED that lights up the area nicely. So you can, if you're doing a pattern, you know, a little shape. So, guys. For all of your ball trimming needs, manscaped.com. Use the promo code TEAM20. You'll get 20% off and free shipping on your first yeah, purchase. Yeah, check out their pack. It's got the ball tonic and, uh, like, it's nice. It's nice. All right. Your balls will thank you. Back to the nitty-gritty uh, war stories here with David Phillips and his book. I'm going to show it up here again for people. Alpha. Eddie Gallagher and the War for the Soul of the Navy Seals. I highly recommend you guys go and check it out. It's out on Amazon now. Um, you get the Kindle version. It's on. It, there's an audio book too, right, David? Uh, yeah, actually, it's really good. I gotta say, <laughs> we went. Through, so we we went through. They gave me three guys to pick from, and they all sounded like retired professors. I was like, this is a story about guys who are all like 30 years old and seals. Can we get someone who sounds like at least they might possibly be a seal? And they said, how about this guy? And I was like, oh my God, he's perfect. And he does a really great job. So props to him. Hey, um, some of the seals from Alpha want to know how they can get in the chat. They just texted me. They're, um, they're listening. Oh, they probably want to, but they probably want to make fun of me. They, they can uh, just go to our YouTube channel. Uh, just tell them to go to our YouTube channel. It's up and running right now. And there's okay. a chat on the, alongside. Tell, tell, tell me, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, what what code word they want to use. Just yeah, I was in, I was in the platoon, and I'll, I'll read their comment. Yeah, uh, text them an identifier. Yeah, 
Good, good. I, I would, uh, and, and by the way, I mean, if any, you guys are watching, if any of you would like to come on the show at some point and say your piece, um, I'm happy to hear from you. You know, some of, uh, there's one seal in particular, the guy who is like the, uh, the, the deputy NCO under Gallagher, Craig Miller. Um, that guy sounds like a, a stand up dude. And, uh, and that's actually what I want to talk about next with you, David, is when they come back home and when they start reporting war crimes to their chain of command. And it was really maybe the most infuriating part of the book is how they kept trying to report and their chain of command. I, I mean, let's just call it what it is. They were strong arming these young soul, these young seals and trying to get them to shut the fuck up, but they wouldn't do it. So that's when, that's probably why I wrote the book, right? If it, if it had just been like about somebody got killed in war, maybe not that surprising, mm -hmm. right? But it was about this larger sort of, <laughs> I, always, I always joke, this is the line I practiced before, but it's a good one. Like the, the Eddie Gallagher, uh, the Eddie Gallagher story isn't much of a whodunit. This is a guy who texted his friends before he deployed that he wanted to stab someone in the skull. And then three eyewitnesses saw him stab somebody. Uh, and then a short time later, he took a picture with the body and the alleged murder weapon and himself. And then he texted that picture to one of his buddies saying, good story behind this, got him with my hunting knife. Like, that's not exactly Sherlock Holmes. Right, that's not right, even right. murder she wrote, right? <laughs> right. Um, it's not much of a whodunit, but this like cultural whodunit, this idea of like why someone would want to do that in the SEAL teams and then why so many people would be willing to try and help him get away with it, I thought was potentially really interesting. Um, so when they reported it, Eddie Gallagher uses the fact that he, you know, the criminal investigation didn't start until a year later as proof that the guys in Alpha are lying. And I think that what got lost is they tried to deal with it first in the SEAL way. Mm -hmm. You know, they have just watched their boss do something mm -hmm. extremely messed up. And so what do you, if you're Craig Miller, the, the second in charge, uh, do you go and talk to the, the OIC, the lieutenant, and you say, hey, man, Eddie can't be doing this. Like, we got to get him out of here. You know, like quietly remove him. We can all go on doing our business. He can go sit in timeout somewhere. Everybody goes home and he gets quietly like put at a desk until he gets the message and leaves the SEALs. Now the SEALs, like that's how they would prefer to do something, you know, quiet, covert, mm -hmm. unconventional. Don't like pull the fire alarm and get big Navy and all the ship drivers. Yeah, handle handle it in-house. That's always the, yeah. the way they want to do it. Uh, absolutely. And I think that that is just human nature, right? But mm -hmm. like human nature is often amplified in, in the, <laughs> the SEALs. So that's the first step they took. And that happened within like hours or, you know, at most a day of the killing. Uh, then, you know, the, the lieutenant essentially says, I'll take care of it. And it takes them a couple months to realize that nothing's happening. The cavalry has not been called and he ain't going to mm -hmm. take care of it. So they go up to the next level, uh, the troop commander, and say, basically do the same thing. Hey, handle this. This bad shit happened. Handle it. And what I don't think they fully appreciated is that the troop uh, commander was extremely tight with Eddie Gallagher. Eddie, he had been Eddie Gallagher's, uh, he'd been like a baby lieutenant on Eddie Gallagher's, one of his uh, Afghanistan tours. Uh -huh. Eddie had sort of taken him under his wing. They'd known each other through several assignments. So they were not only tight, but he, he had vouched for Eddie, given him this plum assignment. And um, if all of a sudden it comes out that like there were big problems with him. Like that comes back on everybody. Right. So he says to the guys, okay, don't worry. I'll take care of this. And again, he doesn't do anything, at least anything that I could find. Uh, and, but it, again, it takes a couple months for them to realize, wait a minute, the troop commander's not doing anything either. They go back to him and say, come on, man, you really got to do something. He says, okay, fine. I will. And again, says nothing. And so they get the run around at, at a low level over and over and over. And I, Think, I can't say this for sure, but I think people definitely knew it uh, pretty high up in, in the enlisted chain of, of a lot of the teams in Coronado. Like it was clear that something messed up had happened, but no one was willing to, to take action against this guy who is popular, but also like a really important of the story they were telling about the awesome job they did in Mosul. Right. Uh, so it wasn't until a year later that, that the platoon finally goes to uh, outside of the family 
and goes to NCIS. And, and I don't think that they really fully understood what that would mean, that they were starting a full-blown criminal investigation that would lead to, uh, you know, people having to testify in court. But they wanted something done because they saw him. If he stayed in, they thought he would only rise in the ranks, continue to uh, have more influence over more SEALs and, and, you know, potentially do even worse stuff than they said they had saw him do. So they didn't feel like they had a choice. They had tried to handle things so many other different ways. And, and this was, I think, an option that none of them wanted to do because they weren't, they weren't at all convinced that they'd get out clean. They thought it was, there was a good chance they'd get uh, discharged from the military at least. Right. And maybe some of them would end up in jail, but they figured, like, what else can we do? It's really interesting. I mean, you point out in the book, too, that their superiors had a duty to report these war crime reports higher, that, that they have received this report from the enlisted guys. It was their duty to push it up higher. Um, and they, they did not do that. Instead, they tried to stymie these guys. They tried to slow it down. They tried to kill it. There's that whole um, event you write about where they call all the guys into one room. And, like, who is it? Like, the Master Chief stands up and, like, are you guys sure you want to report war crime? They're clearly, the senior guys are trying to strong arm the younger enlisted guys into shutting up. Like, like that, that's, a, that's a crime in of itself. I mean, that's almost yeah. the most shocking part of the book. Yeah. But I think that, that all those guys were raised in a culture, a culture of, like, yeah. you know, what, the way they described it. In fact, the way that that Master Chief described it at one point is like, you know, loyalty is a really great thing. You know, it'll make you pull your buddy out of a flaming helicopter and not think twice, but it'll also cr can be really toxic when it becomes, you know, that you never fucking ran. When the right. motherhood um, becomes a mafia. So, uh, these guys were saying like, look, man, like, I think that the exact words of the master chief were like the frag radius of this is going to be huge. Right. Like no matter what happens, like there's going to be collateral and maybe they were, were well-meaning in that. Maybe they're trying to protect these guys, like shut up, go on with your career. Like bad things happen. Right. Not the first time, right. but don't make it worse by actually saying something about it. You know, it's like every dysfunctional family ever, right? right. Like don't deal with it. <laughs> and, <laughs> Just move on. And you know, this is you'll get better when we're not watching. And, and to be fair, like this isn't something that is just like the seals. I mean, the police have the thin blue line, you know, the, the mafia, you know, anytime you have to trust the people around you, there are, there, there are sort of unspoken codes of conduct. And even if you feel morally compelled, there, there's also, there's also a side of you that feels morally compelled not to, you know, not to break the code. And, and all those guys fought that. That was my sense of it, that they were all fighting that. Um, in the end, I mean, a lot of them chose the, you know, they chose the, uh, the hard right over the easy wrong. Um, well, I think it split, it split the platoon. So yeah, like, just yeah. to give, give listeners kind of a sense, platoons got, I might be one or two off here, but 18 guys in it plus Gallagher. Um, and, you know, maybe six testified. Some refused to say a single word and, uh, some the prosecutors were so worried we're going to lie on the stand that they decided not to call them. Um, so it was really complex. And I think everybody was operating from the idea of what's the right thing to do. And it's just telling how complex it was that they came up with so many different answers. And I, I want to get into, you know, some of the big takeaways from your reporting. I mean, we, we are quite familiar with the, um, I guess the Fox News narrative of, of what happened in this trial, um, and, and also factually speaking, we should point out Eddie Gallagher was acquitted of almost all of the charges, except for the one of taking a photo with a, a dead um, ISIS fighter. Um, you know, I, I remember I went on uh, Fox News for a sec something totally separate, and afterwards Pete Hegseth kind of cornered me and like tried to like. Hey, have you heard about this Eddie Gallagher thing? What do you think? He was like trying to convince me the guy was innocent. This is like before the trial. Well, and it's I, a story that they want to believe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and what, what were, what were um, I mean, we know that narrative of, of what happened, but you uncovered a lot of things that are not known or were not known previously, at least to me, um, things that would indicate witness tampering, maybe even jury tampering. I mean, there's some 
pretty serious stuff that I, I think you reported on in this book. Yeah. So I, as you can imagine, since I'm a journalist, it drives me crazy to watch other journalists or worse, people dressing up in journalist clothes and calling them journalists who aren't like do a bad job. And so here's what conservative media, including Fox News, did. They allowed Eddie Gallagher's wife and his brother to come on repeatedly and like give long soliloquies as if it was like an infomercial for Eddie Gallagher's, uh, you know, exoneration. And at times like talk directly to the president about how this was a great injustice. And here's the thing. Andrea Gallagher was not in Mosul. She is not witness to anything. She has no idea about what actually happened. The only source, you know, probably that she had, or, or probably one of the few sources, is her husband. And her husband is obviously saying, I didn't do it. Right. And, and uh, the, the certain media had on had her on and her, her brother-in-law on repeatedly to tell the story, never had on a uh, counterpoint of view, uh, never, uh, you know, even like, you know, I, I give them credit that there, there weren't other SEALs who were going to speak publicly. That was always a barrier. Right. But if you're a journalist who's going to try and like present both sides, you got to find other ways to like say, but look, here's what he's accused of. And, you know, I'm going to point out that, that four different people said, you know, X, Y, Z, um, and that just wasn't done. And I think it's because Eddie Gallagher fits into this narrative that, that Fox wanted to tell. You know, here's this, this big, strong Christian white dude married to you know, an attractive blonde woman. And he's been out there, Navy SEAL, uh, you know, serving his country since 2001. And um, all he's accused of doing is killing a dirtbag ISIS terrorist. And that, that, like, I think those are the exact words that Pete Hegseth used. Um, and like this was sometimes said absurd, overtly and sometimes just nodded to, but should that even be a crime? Like right. murder someone, right? You right. Know? And no one ever said, I think that this is a really powerful thing to think about. Like they said over and over, look, this guy had just been on the battlefield trying to kill these seals. And suddenly like, we're supposed to be nice to him. Like once we captured him, like, come on. But no one ever took the time to to step back and and reverse that and see how they felt about it. So what if during that exact same battle, Eddie Gallagher's position had been overrun, the other SEALs with him had been killed, but Eddie had only been wounded and he'd been taken back by ISIS. And ISIS fighters brought him to the ISIS commander and then the commander kicked him around a little bit and then stabbed him with a knife. Right. Well, we would call them savages. We would be outraged. Like, it would not be any like, hey, war's war. Like, what do you expect? Shit happens. <laughs> it, it was yeah. also very much framed like sort of this anti-military, you know, kind of thing. And right, like deep state, like the enemy, the, the, the bureaucracy is coming. Yeah, right. It, it, like it, it, patriotic it, fighter. It, it dovetailed very well with President Trump's narrative that the military or at least the brass were weak. They were losers. They never win wars. They don't know Bunch how to fight. lawyers and desk pilots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Big time. And I think that's probably why uh, Trump connected so intimately with Eddie Gallagher's story. Like, here's a guy who personified strength and resolve and and all the things that, that the president talked about on the campaign trail. I'm sure the president spent hours and hours and hours talking to generals and admirals who, who were saying, sir, we can't do that. And here's this guy who had done it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he was going to stick up with him. So what happened when this case did go to court martial? I mean, things went pretty haywire. And I mean, I, I'm going to be uh, brutally honest right now. Like if I, I put myself in the position of someone who was on the jury for this trial, I probably would have acquitted Gallagher as well. Because yeah. if I'm being asked to determine whether he's guilty beyond reasonable doubt, I'm going to say no. There, based on what the jury was presented with, there was reasonable doubt presented. Um. Could you talk to us about what happened in that court martial? Yeah, I, so uh, essentially, the, through a series of, of missteps and miscalculations, the prosecution was uh, crippled on day one. They had their most experienced attorney removed just days before the trial started. Uh, the second most experienced, who had never done a trial even remotely this serious, uh, his father had died a few days before, and he was sort of shuttling back and forth between the trial and and dealing with his father's funeral. Um, they were off balance from the start. They didn't have 
um, some of the evidence that they wanted, some things that, that had uh, even been, some of the evidence had been kept out. Um, uh, and, and so you're right, they, they presented sort of a haphazard story. Um, they were not able to counter the uh, really pretty masterful job that the defense did of sowing doubt, of making each one of the witnesses uh, uh, look like they had something to hide. But at the end of the day, you had uh, two, um, two different witnesses who said they saw from close up Eddie Gallagher stab this prisoner. And they had one more that they were ready to call until things fell apart and, and they felt they couldn't call him anymore. So I don't know. It's, I think that I honestly don't know how I would have voted as a member of the jury, because I think to sit in that chair is to see things from a really different perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I, felt I resisted trying to do that, but you have, you have multiple eyewitnesses. You've got Eddie, uh, claiming he did it in a text message. You've got a picture of him with the knife and the body moments after it happened. They didn't, they didn't convict, but I think that that doesn't mean that another jury wouldn't have. What the hell happened with Corey Scott in the, the, this, this sort of moment right out of like a legal thriller, like a, like a Law and Order episode where he changes his testimony on the stand after he had been granted immunity? I mean, that was something that shocked right. everybody. So Corey Scott is... is one of the medics who was right there helping to work on this captive when he says he saw Eddie Gallagher kill him. And uh, he was one of the proponents in the platoon of turning Eddie in, that it was too dangerous to let him continue to be a SEAL and they had to man up and do the right thing. And, you know, guys rallied around him and said, okay, let's do this. So uh, multiple times he saw, he told NCIS investigators before the trial, yeah, I saw my chief, I was like a foot away, saw him stab this, this uh, victim repeatedly, two or three times. He always used words that said, you know, multiple stabs. And then uh, uh, he got up and left and the guy died. So when he got on the stand, he kind of tiptoed through everything he said and added new details that changed everything completely. He said, yeah, I saw him stab him, but it was only once. And I didn't see any blood. I'm not sure if it was a serious stabbing. In fact, I think that the guy continued to live, would have continued to live indefinitely because he was not seriously injured. And Eddie Gallagher, that guy didn't die because Eddie Gallagher killed him. I killed him. I covered his breathing tube and suffocated him. And you're right. It was this type of stuff happens in TV courtroom dramas all the time. It never actually happens in court. Like if there's a surprise that happens on the stand, it's because everybody has done their job completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And this was like, you could not have made a bigger surprise. Like the, the courtroom was completely silent. Um, and, and I think from that point on, it was, it was pretty much obvious that the, the prosecution never got their balance back. They basically folded. They tried, they tried like a, a moving retreat and, and, pulled witnesses, said they weren't going to call them, um, didn't bother trying to get in all this information they had about Eddie's character, about drug use, about lying, about all sorts of other stuff. Um, they just fell apart. And, and so given that, you're right. I think a lot of people were not surprised when acquittals came. And there was also, you talk about in the book how there's a, there was a seal on the jury. Yeah. And ostensibly... He wasn't, of course, supposed to know Gallagher, but he actually did from back in the day. I think that that technically it's OK if you're on a jury and you know someone so long as you can be an impartial mm -hmm. jurist. Um, but what happened was something that suggests that that he couldn't be trusted. Um, uh, all of the jury members are questioned by both the prosecution and the defense before they're picked. And that way, either side can strike someone because they think they can't be fair. Um, so this guy gets up on the stand and people start asking him questions and they say, do you know Eddie Gallagher? And, and my recollection is he sort of shrugged and said, you know, like Coronado is kind of a small community. I've, I've seen him at the gym a few times, but I, I don't really know him. You know, uh, that was not the truth. Uh, and Eddie knew it. 
this guy uh, knew Eddie pretty well. He had been over to Eddie Gallagher's house for Bible study. He had contributed to Eddie Gallagher's like legal defense fund. Um, but he lied about all that stuff on the stand, which is absolutely a crime. Um, now, if he had lied to and Eddie Gallagher had been convicted, Right now, Eddie Gallagher would be using that information to get right, it would trial. be a mistrial. It would have, it would have negated the entire verdict. Uh, uh, our, ju- our judicial system is set up to protect the accused. And so uh, because he was acquitted, they don't get a do-over on that. But it's really serious. I mean, this guy uh, broke the law. Eddie knew it. It's funny. He, Eddie describes how he went to uh, at the next break after this questioning, he goes to his attorneys. He's like, that guy's lying. I know that guy. And his lawyers are like, well, is he lying to help you or is he lying to hurt you? And Eddie's like, I don't know. Um, So we don't know how that seal voted. He may very well have voted to acquit, Um, but he certainly, we do know that he lied on the stand. And and then there's the weird stuff with Corey Scott where like he's over at Eddie's house, like what they were like barbecuing or something like a few days before his testimony. I mean, it's like, what? I I don't I don't know if he was over at their house barbecuing. I do know that he met with Eddie's legal team uh, and and they had communications over a period of months. So uh, and the other thing I know is and this is what sort of tipped off some of the guys in the platoon that something weird was going to happen is that. The day that he walked in to testify, he, he was sort of going through the metal detector at the front door of the courtroom at the same time as uh, Eddie Gallagher's parents. And he very friendly, in a very friendly way, said, oh, hey, are you Eddie Gallagher's parents? And like introduced himself to them and shook their hands. And the other SEALs were watching and thinking like, man, I know what you're going to testify to. Like, you're going to get up in front of these folks and say that you saw their son like stab a guy to death. Like, Something weird is going on because no one would act that way if that's what they plan to do. Um, now, I don't know, and I want to be very clear on this. I don't know if, if Corey Scott did cover the victim's breathing tube and suffocated him. Um, I mean, you can imagine different scenarios where that's likely, where you've been left with somebody who's been mortally wounded, but maybe taking longer to die than anyone would want him to. And, and you just do something that like that. And, and he, he, had, that, he had immunity, so he could also get away with saying right, whatever he right. wanted. That's true. That's true. And uh, well, it protects him from everything but lying. You know, he has to get up there and tell the truth. Okay. But what, what, um, what trained military lawyers who watched his testimony told me that I didn't pick up right away as a journalist is he told a story that seemed like designed by a legal mind to specifically <laughs> get right. Eddie out of trouble while not getting Corey Scott in trouble for perjury. Uh, it was a story that, that just walked the right line so that Corey Scott never contradicted anything he said before, uh-huh. but he added new things that insulated and protected Eddie. And there's that really, the, the one scene in your book about, it, it was painful to read, where Corey Scott and Craig Miller sit down after the trial it was actually uh, Josh Friends. It was Josh Friends. That's right. Thank you. And I mean, would you want to talk about that encounter? I mean, that's part of the sort of underlying, you know, how this entire trial ripped this platoon apart and just ruined their friendships. And, yeah. and you know, Corey, rem- no, go remember, ahead. like these are guys that would all take a bullet for each other. Um, and uh, the act of testifying, of testifying specifically against a seal, tore them apart. And so after Corey Scott went up there and told this, this new and different story, the other guys were stunned. Mm-hmm. You know, their reaction was many things. Most of them didn't believe it. Uh, they believed it, he was lying to protect Eddie. But they thought like, man, like, if it was true, why didn't you just tell us months ago? Like, we didn't have to go through this. We right. didn't all have to go to trial. We didn't have to get our names dragged out and be insulted by you know, the, the SEAL veteran community, we didn't have to get shit talked on, on Fox News, like none of this had to happen. And they felt like really betrayed and bewildered by why this guy would do that. Um, and after the trial, Corey Scott tried to reach out to a number of these guys. And um, most of them said no, uh, or several of them said no. Uh, and at first, Josh Renz, who's this big and, and really was one of the more aggressive 
uh, snipers on, on the, in the platoon. At first he said no, but eventually he said, you know, what the hell, let's see what he's got to say. And they meet up. And what Corey Scott or what he says Corey Scott told him is that this was a good deal. This was the right thing to do. Look, we wanted Eddie out of the seals that happened. We didn't have to send another seal away for life to prison for killing an ISIS guy. You know, he's out now, you know, and so we can all go uh, about our lives and, and we all won. And Josh friends uh, and a couple of the other guys had left the seals, uh, you know, in part because of, of everything that had happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple of these guys were, you know, suicidal during this time. It had been like a really rough road. And, you know, to hear one of his teammates who he'd been really close to try and sell it as like, yeah, but this was, this was the best thing possible. Uh, and we should just, it's water under the bridge. Let's make up. He couldn't do it. You mm -hmm. know, he, he basically said like, I can't, I, you know, I think you're a coward and a traitor. And I never want to see you again. You know, there, there's, I, I mean, there's so many things that it's like you said, like if you were on the jury, you don't know which way you go. But like my, for me, I start thinking that like if I were in that situation, if, if I were on a team and somebody were not, not just the murder or the alleged murder, or whatever, not just that incident, but the behavior leading up to it, um, you know, whether the morality of what the killing, if it happened, bothered me, it would be more an act like I'm getting pulled into something that pretty soon is going to really affect me that like this is going to get worse and worse and worse. And we've got to protect ourselves and get him off the team. So it's possible that it was less of a like a, a moral decision that we feel bad that he killed this guy. And like, he's going to bring us down with him at some point. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. I think he, you're spot on, you know, and, and that's maybe part of the reason why you step forward is because you're like, well, it's either this, you know, he's kind of running away. Uh, you know, with his behavior and things like that. And how do we protect ourselves? We got to get him off the team. Um, and when I think like that, I think, well, maybe they did lie about, you know, not maybe they did, but that would be a plausible reason that people would lie about it if his other behavior wasn't, it, it was hard to like set that up as, look, we need to get rid of him. He's doing these bad things. He was shooting and saying that he killed people or or whatever. Um. I, so what I'm what I'm saying is like I, I would like think both ways that maybe he did and and they legit are trying to bring it out and maybe he didn't and they're he's done a lot of other stuff but this is the one thing they think that you know can get him away from the team and make them safe. Yeah, and I think that that it was all over the map in terms of how people felt. There are certainly people in the platoon who did not care that he had executed an ISIS fighter. Right. Um, uh, and there were people that just thought it was abhorrent. Um, uh, but you're, you're right that they all, I think across the board saw it as a huge liability. Mm -hmm. That like, <clears throat> What happens if that video that the Iraqis were taking while he was doing this gets out what happens if it ends up on al jazeera like this is bad like we're all could go down this guy's got to be taken care of before worse thing happen like maybe if we're lucky we can manage this uh and i think that that's how they they pitched it to their officer in charge and and thought they had taken care of it and they just didn't um so you know then it i think when it came down to it I don't know if anyone was necessarily angry at people who didn't <clears throat> testify, who mm -hmm. chose to stay silent. You know, maybe they, it made them second guess the character of that person. Like if you're not going to stand up in this fight, I don't, I don't necessarily need you in my circle anymore, but I don't think they'd be angry about it. But the guys who, who agreed to stand up, you know, they all went through the door together and then and then changed uh that i think they saw really differently and they saw that as 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 big of a betrayal as what eddie had done to the team as its chief 
Um, I, I, I think that that was part of the injury for these guys as much as, as what Eddie did is, is seeing how people shifted and, and really tried to take actions that were ultimately really selfish. They felt it was, it was cowardice. And I mean, it's, it's such a, a wild story. And I, I wanted to ask too, you know, in the, the, the follow-up to all of this, um, what, is the, what do you think this trial and, and this entire incident represents for the SEAL teams? Where do they go from here? Um, uh, well, let's just start there for, <laughs> for now. That's a, it's a huge subject. Yeah, I, so I guess it's too early to tell, right? Mm -hmm. um, are the SEALs going to feel that there's like a major overhaul that needs to be done, you know, um, because of this really high, high profile incident that happened and are they going to drill down to understand what were the contributing factors mm -hmm. you know like how does a guy like eddie gallagher become a chief because uh, mm -hmm. it seems like he was not very naturally equipped with the skills that you might need um uh i don't know if they're going to do that you know do they are they so interested in in you know the short-term deployment cycle that 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 type of stuff just gets pushed to the back and eventually forgotten. I'm not sure. We'll see. But there's certainly people in the SEALs that that think it's really important that this is a wake-up call and and they need to deal with some of this stuff. I, I think it's interesting also that just a few years ago, SOCOM did this huge ethics review and they came forward and testified in front of Congress. We found no systemic ethical issues in special operations. And well, they're that, grading their own homework, man. Right, exactly. And then you see what uh, these incidents snowball. You have the Gallagher thing. You have the Dev Group guys uh, who killed uh, Sergeant Melgar in Niger. All these other incidents that keep adding up and adding up until it becomes completely obvious to the entire country that there are systemic issues within these bureaucracies, within these commands. And then they, and then only then do they come forward and say, "Yes, we have ethical issues in the ranks. We're going to work on." It's kind of like. You've been lying to us the whole time. Well, you know, it's funny. I got a message uh, uh, this morning, actually, from a uh, minister of parliament in Australia who had oh, been yeah. in the special air service. And he, uh, for listeners who don't know, the special air service is going through this, this really uh, painful period where there's been an, uh, just a massive outside independent investigation of allegations of war crimes in Afghanistan. And I found, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, but found evidence of, of several illegal killings and also just a culture of, of initiation killing and, and bloodlust and, and mm -hmm. all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and, you know, what he said is, is, you know, that in many ways, the SEALs and SAS shared a culture. They trained together. <laughs> they worked together. He had worked with Dev Guru several times. And, you know, he said the big difference is, you know, in his estimation was that the SAS had faced a real independent exhaustive review and it, the SEALs never have, you know, like you right. said, it, it's, it's all been internal. You know, everybody looks at themselves and says, we're doing great. Well, I mean, I had sources way back telling me that the reason why the SAS, Australian SAS guys started carrying hatchets on target was because they got that from Dev Group, that they were cross-training with them. And so it, it, it was, it pollinates. It's like you said uh, early on, it's like a virus that spreads. Yeah, yeah, because each one of them wants to be the most badass. And if yeah. you're the certain type of guy who thinks that like carrying a hatchet is badass, like it's on. Eddie carried, I don't, we didn't mention this before, but Eddie, who tried out for Dev Gru and didn't make it in, uh, carried a hatchet in Mosul uh, and talked about how he couldn't wait to use it. Yeah, and I mean, it goes, like you said, it's a culture, um, that previous deployment in Afghanistan where, you know, they had a guy dressing up like a Native American in a loincloth riding through villages. And like, it's just weird stuff. Like, we're beyond criminal it's like, what's going on inside these units? What's going on inside these formations that this sort of behavior is normalized? Yeah, yeah. And I wish, you know, I, I when I was reporting this and talking to other SEALs who are outside the platoon or trying to understand more about Eddie Gallagher's uh, past, I kept coming across sort of other corridors that you could easily go down yeah, and, yeah. and maybe find similar stuff. And I was just like, no, you got to just like, 
tell this one story and tell it really well because I think it, it tells the story yeah. of, of a lot of other things. And, and you know, if you, if you go into the rabbit hole, <laughs> who knows what you'll come out with. All right, let's hit up some uh, user questions here. Cypher, thank you. And uh, D asking about the scarecrow. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, what else do we got here? Oh, you're welcome, D. Jerry's saying he doesn't believe journalists because his unit got disbanded. Hey, okay, buddy. Um, I don't know. I, I think some of the questions maybe got lost up above, but um, I thought there were, yeah, we had a couple more, didn't we? Yeah, I think they just get lost after a certain period of time, unfortunately. But um, I don't know, David, what are, I mean, we've uh, covered a lot in this podcast. Uh, is there anything else from the book, any major takeaways that I didn't mention that you think people should know about? Uh, yeah, actually, like, I don't, I don't see it as a book really about Eddie Gallagher, even though he's like the main presence in there. He's like the he's like the dragon that everybody else has got to fight, you know, like, um, but he's not actually the, 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 the driving character. Uh, and there's so many cool guys that are in alpha who, um, you know, just like tried to do the best they were, could in a really impossible situation. And, and are, are, you know, we spent, you know, more than an hour talking about problems in the seals, but those guys are, are awesome. And a real, uh, you know, they are the, the value of the seals, the guys that you want to have in there. And I think that's probably less likely to get lost on, on, a, uh, with an audience like this that understands the subtlety of it. That's what I worry about when I'm, uh, talking to a, a civilian audience is like, when I say a seal, I'm not talking the seals. And when I'm talking like, a cultural problem. It doesn't mean that it's uh, it's it's systemic and like across the board. There's so many good dudes that are in the teams, um, and I just don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah, it. I, it you know, it, I think that's one of the things that um, that when people see spec ops guys misbehaving, um, or see corporate guys misbehaving, or see you know that or that, if one journalist gets your unit disbanded. Right, right. Um, or, or that's it. Or journalists misbehaving, you know, uh, making things up or whatever. Like, or just being dumb. Right. It's more common. We rarely make things up, but a lot of times we're stupid. <laughs> well, and that, that's the thing is that, like, there are toxic people in every single culture across the board, everywhere, every profession. And the challenge is what are the internal checks and balances in a system to right. keep those, th those toxic personalities from getting into positions of leadership where they make that sort of uh, that sort of thing like sane, right? It's like it's sort of like a sociopath conditioning everybody to say this is normal. Yeah. And when it's just like twelve of you sitting around in you know Afghanistan for X number of months, it's not that hard for anybody to start going. I I guess this is normal. All oh, right. You know, let's uh, let's get through these questions. Yeah, I'll let David go in okay. a few minutes. Here, uh, so. Let's see here. Um, let's, where do uh, we start? Uh, FSB, FSB. This is yeah, not us. Yeah, new. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, firstly, David, you're an amazing author. Uh, Alpha was fantastic. With that said, how much faith do you and Jack have in uh, a commission or Commander Rosenblum's plan to institute ethics into the uh, uh, the naval, the naval warfare, warfare pipeline? pipeline? How much uh, change will come from it? And that's from Dick, uh, that's from Jackson. So, so for people who aren't familiar with the story, Captain Rosenblum was the commodore in charge of all naval special warfare on the West Coast. So he was the brass who oversaw all this stuff. And after that command, when this was all done and the whole trial had sort of blown up in the Navy's face, he decided to do sort of a ground level uh, junior leader ethics training where they would teach this uh, case study, what happened with Alpha and Eddie Gallagher. And he would bring in um, uh, Craig Miller, one of the uh, guys from the platoon to help him tell the story. And it, in a way it was like a very like seal solution, you know, like, 
go under the radar, you know, screw big Navy, do this at the level of the team with the guys. Mm-hmm. You know, that's very like small units warfare. And I think that that is really brilliant because it's a cultural problem. Eddie Gall- Gallagher is a cultural problem. And so in order to deal with it, you got to change the culture and you do that seal to seal guy to guy. And, and you just like talk about what actually happened and why it's, it's not, it doesn't fit in what we do. And so to that extent, like it's brilliant. Uh, but like how, how much can you scale it? You know, how many people can they reach? Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, Captain Rosenblum just retired, I believe, like less than a month ago. So he's not in that mix anymore. Uh, Craig Miller is, uh, has a, a, he's training SEALs at, at Bud's. He's a chief now. So, you know, he has some time that he can devote to this, but it's, it's the Navy has him doing other stuff. So are their efforts enough? I don't know. I think their efforts are effective and smart and like very much like in the frogman like mindset. But but are they going to reach all the people they need to? I, maybe time will tell. Um, Andrew, thank you. I was pretty sure that one of the, uh, those years, Ted Haggard was the biggest store in Colorado Springs. Yeah. I, um, so I, so Ted Haggard is, is, uh, he was actually a really uh, charming guy and, and worth uh, checking up on because he's had a third act, but he was a a nationally prominent evangelical pastor who got, uh, had this like swift downfall because he got caught buying methamphetamine from a gay prostitute who was also, he was also using as a prostitute. Happens to the best Um, of us. God God works in mysterious ways. He just had a rough day. Really? That was like, um, (laughs) But so like he had a stunning fall and was totally like cast out by his community. And it was a very sort of Christian story of how he has really reevaluated himself and what he thinks of as like being a Christian and how you can come back from that and maybe be a better person, Um, which I think is fascinating. So if anyone uh, is interested in where Ted Haggard is now, you should look him up. Okay. Interesting. Uh. Dickie, thank you. Uh, brain chip, not like DARPA. He's talking about his New York Times brain chip. Oh, okay. Right, right. Uh, Jackson, thank you. To what degree was Eddie influenced by a dev group? Of sh- oh, we, we did that, right? Uh, dev group uh, shootings, uh, kill counts, wearing a tomahawk and knife. Or is this probably- I think that he really, really wanted to be a badass and really, really wanted to be a dev group and was never able to make the cut. So, you know, he had a little bit of a complex, I would assume, from not making it and maybe tried to, to posture that much more after that. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Did Secretary of the Interior uh, Ken Salazar really threaten to deck him? Can you yes. elaborate? <laughs> he did. I was reporting on wild horses, which are fall under a federal program controlled by the Secretary of Interior. And uh, I uncovered that his his next door neighbor had been illegally buying thousands of horses, sorry, 1200 horses and sending them to slaughter uh, uh, with, and it was obvious that he was doing it and nobody in the bureaucracy was doing a thing about it. So I wanted to ask him about it. And he got mad about that and and threatened to punch me out. Um, Awesome. Jackson, thank you. How much are weak officers to blame for uh, Naval Special Warfare drifting uh, uh, ethically, what did other SEAL officers you spoke to say about Lieutenant Portier, Portier and the troop commander? I so I I don't know enough to that about that to give you a real answer um, because I focus so much on this one platoon, and in this one platoon, the uh, officers were completely worthless or or possibly criminal. Um, uh, so. And it was understood in the culture of this platoon, which I think is is maybe somewhat common, that that the chief outranks the officer in charge. The officer in charge is is a pencil pusher. He's there to to handle the bureaucracy, but he's he's not actually Do, doesn't doesn't technically outrank him, but in terms of clout, outranks him. Right, be, right, be, right, right, right. Uh, and and that's just like accepted in the culture. And I don't think that's uncommon. That pops up all over the military sure. to some extent, but I think in the SEALs, maybe more so. And so, you know, the, the, the kids are, are, are running the school and in, in a, to a certain ex- 
extent. Um, Mike Hollard, thank you. Thanks for having David on. Uh, Eddie did a great podcast with Andy Stumpf. Any chance of having him on here to respond to this book? I mean, uh, I'm not. Uh, it, so, what, so we should say that if he doesn't come on, that Eddie has done tons and tons of podcasts. He's never spoken to me. In fact, currently he's suing me for defamation, but he has done a lot of speaking on his own. So if you feel like you want to hear his perspective, it's, it is there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely said his piece. That's for sure. Uh, Jackson, thank you. Is there any chance NSW could actually be disbanded as more and more information comes out during Ooh, that's the G1? A spicy one. That's a spicy one. I, I, I'm not. I'm certainly not one to uh, be able to answer that. They they have not indicated to me that that is even the discussed. the Australians disbanded Second Squadron of their Special Air Service Regiment. Um, so the the rest of their Special Ops is untouched. But one squadron did get get disbanded. Could that ever happen here? I, no idea. Yeah, and they, the Germans did a similar thing with, with one of their KSK. special ops groups. Well, we're also in, in this case... I don't know if we're there yet. I mean, maybe no, we are. I, when I say I don't know, I mean, I don't know it's how got, deep the problem goes. Well, but. And, I mean, in this case, we're actually looking at, you know, one person who was off the reservation and the rest of the team, or a, a, a larger part, it, that it wasn't, you know, a... a a whole like a, a platoon or a squadron right. or whatever right. that had gone rogue. Um, right. So um, Jackson, you refer to pirate culture in Alpha. Just how prevalent is it in other soft units? Is it I unique? Don't, I don't know, and that's a really good question. And I would love to know if I if I knew, I would say it. Uh, I think that Eddie was raised by pirates in another unit. He didn't suddenly. Uh, uh, create this culture. He was taught it. It was learned. And what I've been able to learn is that it's been sort of an undercurrent, not the majority culture, but a subculture in the SEAL since Vietnam. And it is, it is a, a real and widely dispersed uh, group of guys. Now, it's not like they have an initiation ceremony or they even necessarily call themselves pirates, but it's, it's a way of thinking, a way of doing things that I think is not the majority, but is certainly, you know, uh, enduring. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, the whole pirate, hooligan, brigand, uh, ne'er-do-well, like uh, roughneck, I, you know, that I think all of the soft units in, in to one degree or another, you know, feel that way. And that's why it's important. And I think one of the challenges with SEALs is they don't, they don't come up from privates, you know, in a in a really structured system where they're being mentored, you know, up that chain like that. You know, you, you join the team and you're on the team. It's a small team. And so in the other units where you still have that kind of, you know, yeah, we're, we're you know, uh, hooligans or whatever, there's still the military discipline or, or right. the covering of it as long as the leadership is strong. You know, it's interesting you recognize that because they really like their culture comes from the, the World War II frogman rafts, like rubber boats. Mm -hmm. And it's still like that idea of like, it's egalitarian. You're all there in like shorts. There's no place to put your rank. Everyone's going by first names. Like that made sense in the boat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the teams have really carried it forward. Like they, they still, to a large extent, like treasure that. Um, uh, but you're right. It, it comes with risks. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jackson, thank you. Jack, David, and Matthew Cole need to do a round table. I would love to do that. That'd be cool. I think that, that Cole knows a lot more than I do about the teams. Uh, Jackson, thank you for Jack and David. How, just how widespread is drug use in uh, Naval special warfare and concern to other soft units is Eddie an outlier or the norm? Oh, so, uh, I can only, I don't, can't open that answer that broadly, but I can tell you that because I had so many of Eddie's text messages, I can tell you that there were no shortage of other chiefs um, that he uh, would hit up for tramadol or talk about doing tramadol with. I think that there was a whole generation that got introduced to it when it wasn't even prescription and realized they really liked it. Um, 
so like that's a problem. Like I said, that's that's not a, a problem unique to the SEALs. That's an American problem about like opioids. It's it's but, very common but, with uh, a lot of soldiers, special ops guys, whoever. I mean, they get they get injured overseas. And they end up getting addicted to the painkillers and, and things like that. Like that's very right. And and like common. the you know that's the double edged sword of being a seal is is like if you're a homeless guy off the street and you come in and say, oh man, my neck hurts, I need some tramadol. People are going to think you're scamming. But if you're a Navy SEAL and you've got this halo over your head and you go in and say, <laughs> I, you know, I, I my neck's hurting after that operation. No one's going to think you're scamming. Like literally, they were giving Eddie like a thousand pill refill. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is you're talking about people who are like risk seeking, you know, they, they picked a profession. So you go over there, you're in combat, you come back to the States and you're like, well, what now? Like what now? And if you don't find a way to deal with that, right. uh, you know, going into, you know, drug use, I think is a, um, Jerry, thank you. It is not about what is right. It is what you can prove in court. Oh, Yeah. Jackson, is it common seeing older SEALs compromise younger SEALs or soft operators with blackmail? Are situations like Eddie and Melgar more common than expected? Uh, I don't know if it's fair to call it common, yeah. but there are cer certainly other incidents that I uncover where it's just, if you're kind of a dirty guy, it's helpful to to be dirty with the guys that you serve with so that you don't have to worry about it. It's right. it's a way, it's like a, a really weird way to build trust. Right. And again, it's sort of like police, right? If you can co-opt your, your, you know, the guys you work with. Um, yeah. Uh, Cypher, thank you. Great podcast friends. And that's where, that where we got to. Um, okay. Cool, man. So were there any other, while we were doing that? Guys, the book is Alpha, written by journalist David Phillips. Joined us here for two hours tonight on your Friday evening. I really appreciate you taking the time with us tonight, David. Um, this has been a wild conversation. It's it's a topic everybody in the country knows about, but this is the whole story behind the story that they haven't heard yet. Um, and there's a lot in here that we did not have an opportunity to talk about. I hope people will go and pick up the book or the audio book or the ebook or however, however the hell you prefer to read these and, and I gotta absorb say, this information. Like, it, it it is a crazy story. When I was writing it and I was coming across all the details, uh, I was like, "Man, if I wrote this as fiction, no one would believe it." So, like, seriously, <laughs> yeah. like, if you are even slightly interested in in what life in one of these platoons is like, especially when it goes completely off the rails, like, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I, I didn't write it as a think piece. I wrote it to to read like a novel, so it's not a hard read. That, that must, I mean. That must have been a hell of a time for the guys on the team trying to decide oh, where they were. Yeah, I can't imagine. To be that close and then to have that kind of split. Yeah, um, when, when I tried to put myself in those shoes, uh, you know, like the idea of turning on my platoon sergeant like that would be like so unthinkable. But then also when I think back to it, my platoon sergeant was ethical. I disagreed with him sometimes, but he was a good guy deep down. He was a good guy. He was professionally, he was very competent and he, he would never have allowed the things that happened in that platoon to have happened to us. And now, now I, I respect, he, he passed, he was killed in, in Afghanistan, sadly, my platoon sergeant. Um, but I can recognize him and respect him even more now because I realized the things he did to protect me and protect the guys I worked with and to make sure that we all stayed on the right. Um, and, and I mean, that's, that's how I, I, I guess I choose to remember, um, Sergeant Van Alice, who's my platoon sergeant, Ranger Battalion, um, even though he's not with us anymore. We have a couple more that have just come in. Um, Jim G, thank you. You must know people in 10th Special Forces Group. What are the major cultural differences you observe between SF, ODAs, and SEAL teams? Oh, boy, that's, that could go on for a long time. That's a spicy uh, one. It's, it's just, just as a, a different mindset, I feel like. I mean, like... I, a lot of the SF guys that I talk to, and, and you guys can probably chime in, I think they tend to think of the SEALs as, as cowboys um, and maybe are a little resentful that uh, they get more attention and more public adulation. Uh, it's the, sometimes they're a little reckless. I don't know if that's across the board, but that's, that's the comments that stick in my mind from conversations I've had. Uh, Brian Fisk, uh, Gibbons, thank you very much. And D, what does the amount of media books post service by SEALs say 
about their culture versus other spec ops and link in with Eddie, Eddie's glory seeking. So here's the most messed up thing about SEALs that write books. Like, of course, like many people have pointed out before that they're supposed to be silent professionals and they're not. Okay, so like, let's get that out of the way as a given. But the guys who are really good at it, the guys who stay in for a career and retire as, as master sergeants or something, they're not the ones writing the books. It's the guys who get out, you know, like soon after, who don't rise up, who don't make the cut. Um, they're the ones who are writing the books. So the people that you have as the public spokesman for the SEALs are in, in many ways, I mean, not always, but in many circumstances are mediocre <laughs> SEALs, which is kind of crazy. Um, and the guys who are the real uh, silent professionals let it happen because they're not going to say anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean... The, the the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? That the, the, these be- makes the money. Yeah, I mean, these-, some of these guys make serious, serious money. They're doing like corporate like retreats where they can tell you like the seal like secrets of leadership, and then like other seals will be like, "Bro, that guy was a bad leader," <laughs> you know. But yeah. they don't say anything publicly. It, it blows my mind some of these guys that get out and they lecture all of us about leadership, and, but based on what we know about leadership in the seal teams, that they don't really have it. It's odd. Yeah, or, or even like them as an individual. I mean, I can't tell you how many times this has happened with people who shall not be named, but are, are well-known SEALs. And other SEALs who never speak publicly can't wait to tell you like how like lousy they were. <laughs> like, I can't believe that he's doing that. He sucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing is like amongst other services, SEALs kind of get a, a bad rep sometimes. And it's real. it's not because of the the great guys who are doing the job that, you know, and keeping their mouth shut. It's, you know, because the guys who aren't quiet, the, 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 the small minority, you know, that the hucksters. Yeah. So folks, thank you for joining us this Friday. This has been an incredible episode with David next episode. uh, Next Friday, we're going to have Bob Adolph. He was a UN chief of security and a retired special forces officer. He's going to be here in studio. Uh, We're really looking forward to having him here in person. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, like us, uh, give us a little thumbs up, leave some comments, tell us if you think we suck or not, and uh, we'll see you next Friday. And David, again, thank you. The book is Alpha. I hope you guys will go pick it up and give it a read. Thanks, guys. That was great. And great work on the book. I mean, it's amazing what, what, what you